And today we are going to talk about why evangelism. You know what? You need to know the why. You need to know the why you, you exist. You need to know the why you work. You, you need to know the why you do something. In order for you to have this passion to do something, you have to know the why. Not just the what. You should know the why. Why you're doing that? Why do you exist? Why, 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 why Delilah? Why, why, why Delilah? Okay, why evangelism? Let's pray. Father, thank you. Your word is alive, like a double-edged sword. And we would like to hear the very word that would come from the mouth of God. Open our eyes, open our minds, replace our hearts, O oh God, with expect with the expectation. Just anything, O oh God, that hinders us from hearing your word, we cancel it in the name of Jesus. We refuse to believe the lies of Satan right now, and we would like to focus on you. Fill us, O oh God, with your word, that we may be able to stand in your word with confidence, with strength, and with power in Jesus' name. Amen. We are the reason why we need to evangelize. A simple reason. We are commanded to share the good news of Christ and people are lost without Him. What is evangelism? Evangelism is sharing the good news so that people may hear. Why evangelism? Evangelism why? We are commanded to share the good news that, because the people are lost without Him. Okay? So what now we are on why? Church is not about sharing our church. It's not about sharing our church to people. It's about sharing Christ. It's not about sharing the beauty of our music team. It's not just about sharing the, the comfort of this church. But it's about sharing Christ to people. It's not just about sharing our church, but it's about Christ. We just don't bring people to church every Sunday. After Sunday, it's about sharing. It's about bringing the church outside. Because church is Christ and the church is you. Church is us and church is the Christ. So we just don't, we just, we just don't bring people to church but we have to learn to be convicted to bring the church to our workplace, to our community, to our home. Because church, the head of the church is Christ and the body of church is you. So when we bring the church to our community outside the four corners of this room, then we are bringing Christ to our community. Let's bring Christ. Let's bring Christ. Let's bring the church outside these four corners of this hall. Do you understand that church? Are you still there? Are you helping? Come on. Come on. Yeah? <laughs> because church is Christ and us. I'm so excited to go out there and share my church because church is Christ and church is me because once they have the Christ coming to church is not a problem it's not a difficult thing if they already have the Christ it would be a natural reaction it would be just a natural response if they have the Christ they would go to church that's right right yeah you know what you don't say, I, I don't have anything to do this Sunday and I'm going to church. No, it's not. You are the church. Church is your part of life because you are the church. So when you go to your workplace on, Sunday, on Monday, you're bringing the church. You don't come to church because you don't have anything to do. But you go outside the four corners of this room, go to, to the community, you are bringing the church because you are the church. Okay? And that's why we need to evangelize. You yourself, you are 
an evangelism already. And I would like to read the verse for today. Mark 16, 15 to 20. He said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. But whoever does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will be accompany those who believe in my name. They will drive out demons. They will speak in new tongues. They will pick up snakes with their hands. PG, parental guidance. I'm not asking you to touch or hold snakes. You might be, might get, might get beaten, and I don't want that to happen to you. And I'm going to explain that later, why Mark uh, wrote this kind of things. And you're going to drink deadly poisons. It will not hurt them at all. I'm not asking you to drink deadly poisons. Come on, I'm not telling you that. But Pastor John, it says there, I'm going to hold snakes. I'm going to pick up snakes. I'm going to drink deadly poison. I will not be hurt. No, I'm not telling you that way. Later on, I'm going to explain to you. It will not hurt them at all. They will place their hands on sick people, and they will get well. After the Lord, Jesus had spoken to them. He was taken up into the heaven. He sat down, sat at the right hand of God. So Jesus Christ, where is Jesus Christ right now? He is seated at the right hand of God. Jesus Christ is not resting. He's not taking a tea break. He's not a smoke break for Jesus Christ. He is seated at the right hand of the Father. Do you know what He's doing there? He is interceding for each and every one of you. He is talking about you to the Father. He is seated at the right hand of the Father. After he died on the cross, he sat down at the right hand of the Father. This is what the Bible says. Then the disciples went out and preached everywhere. And the Lord worked with them and confirmed his word by the signs accompanied by it. In these verses that we have read, three things, uh, four things that we could learn. First is, Christ commanded us to share the good news. Tell the person next to you, Christ commanded me. Don't you, huh? Christ commanded me to share the good news. Come on, boast it. Be proud of it. Come on. Christ commanded me to share the good news. You should be proud of it. You should be proud of it. You have to boast about it. Come on. Christ commanded me to share the good news. When a commanding officer commanded you of something, it must be obeyed, right? If you enlisted yourself, come on, come on, come on, can, can we give a, pray, a hand of praise to Jesus? That's right. That's right. Yeah? When you enlist yourself as a soldier, you have to obey the command of your commanding officer. A command is meant to obey. As Christians, we are enlisted like a soldier of Christ. Christ is our commanding officer. And you are commanded by Jesus because He sees a potential, a great potential in you as a Christian. You know what? I know what to command to my children. If I'm going to command something to them, I know that they have the capabilities, they have the power to do it. If I know that they cannot do something, I won't command that to them anyway. I know that you could do this, Mako. Yeah, that's why I am commanding you to do this. But it's up to them if they're going to obey what I have commanded them. But I know for sure I will not command something to them that is not that they won't be able to do. I know with all my heart, you could do it. That's why I'm commanding. God knows you. God knows your capabilities. That's why He knows what He's going to command on your life. I know what to command to my children. The more God, the Father in heaven, the, the, who knows everything, He knows what to command on you. Because He trusts you. God trusted you so much. That's why He gave you a command. Something that you could only do 
by only Christians could do. That's why you should be proud of it. God commanded you to do something, not to make your life miserable, not to make your life harder. No, 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 no. God commanded you to do something because He wants to bless you. Because there is blessing in giving. I'm sorry, in blessing in obeying. Yes, there is. There is blessing in giving. But when you obey, there is blessing in obedience. It is one way of blessing you. It is one way of, of seeing and experiencing the power of God when you obey the command of God. And in this verse, God commanded us to go into all the world and preach. Therefore, you must stand faithful. Therefore, you must stand reliable. Therefore, you must stand capable. Therefore, you must stand dependable as a soldier of Christ. If God needs you as a soldier, if God needs you as a Christian, you should always be there. Here I am, Lord. Use me. You are a soldier of Christ. Jesus didn't say, please, or can you? Please preach. Can you preach? Can you share the word of God? No, it's not. It is a command to all Christians. If you declare that you are a child of God, that you, have, you, obey, you accept Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, therefore, take it as a command. Go and share. Go and preach the Bible. This is a command. It's an honor to receive a command from the prime minister, from the president, from the kings. Imagine, prime minister, is he already prime minister? Not yet? Not yet? Okay. Uh, or, or, or from your president. Who's your president? Duterte, or, or what have you, or a high-ranking official. He, he commanded you. It's an honor to receive a command from a high-ranking official. It's an honor to receive a command from the Father in heaven, the creator of heaven and earth. The same yesterday, today, and forever. The Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, commanded you to grow. Why evangelism? Because God, Christ, the Holy Spirit, the Triune God, commanded you to share the good news. It's an honor. Imagine, you are commanded of something. God entrusted you of something. Come on, Lord, have your way. This command is not just from the mouth of a high-ranking official. It is from the mouth of Jesus himself. Go and preach. It's a command. As a soldier, you have to obey. Come to think of this. If, you have command, if God commanded you of something, do you think he's not a, he is not able to help you to fulfill that command, if only you would respond. If only you would say yes. Jesus can actually do it all by himself. But he wants you to be part of his great work in this world. Share the good news to all the world. It says here, there is no limitation. You are commanded to share the the word to share the good news to all peoples of all walks of life, all age, all groups, all social standings, and all cultures. Let's go. Let's go. It's a big mistake to think that you new people would come here every Sunday. It's a big mistake. Yes, there would be few people who would knock there in the door. Can I come to your church? Yes, there are few. Just like uh, our friend here, uh, Grant. He just knocked on the door and he wants to come. But seldom you could experience that. Let's refuse to believe that people would just freely come here with their own, volunt- with, with their own hearts coming here. No. We have to go and share the gospel, share Christ with them in order for them to come to Christ. No one would come out from their bed one morning and tell, Come on, oh, what a great day. I'm going to look for a church. I'm going to go get any, uh, I'm going to uh, internet and look for a church that is nearby. No, no people would, would, would go, get up in the morning and look for a church. Yes, there would be people. 
But most of the people who came to church, they were invited. Gospels, uh, gospel were sh- was shared to them. Come on. So today, this is your day. Christ commanded you. We need to go out to invite people to come to church and hear the good news. You have to obey the command of God. Because in obeying God, it proves your love for Him. When you obey the command of God, it proves your faith in God. When you obey the command of God to go, it's your, your obedience is better than sacrifice. Your obedience brings blessing. And second point that we could see here is, you have in your own possession the greatest news. Tell yourself, I own, I possess the greatest news. Available for all mankind. We have in our profession the greatest news. It says there as we continue reading the verse 15 of Mark 16, the gospel. You have the gospel in your hand. There was a story of Prince Chrysler from 1875 to 1962. The world famous violinist. Do you heard about him? I've, I have already told this story maybe years back. It's about this world-famous violinist. He earned fortune with his concerts and compositions. But he generously gave most of his money, all his earnings, he gave it away. So when he discovered an exquisite, exquisite violin on one of his trips, because he's going uh, all, over, uh, all over, over, over the world to play his violin, but he saw one exquisite violin but he wasn't able to buy it because he got no money later having raised enough money to meet the asking price for that exquisite violin that he would like to play and own he returned to the seller and hoping the purchase that he could purchase it that beautiful instrument but to his great dismay it had been sold to a collector He was so disappointed. And Chrysler made his way to the new owner's home, to this collector. And he offered to buy the violin. The collector said it had become his prized possession. This is now my prized possession, the collector said. And I cannot sell it to you. And Chrysler was disappointed. He was about to leave the house of the collector. But he said, Could I play the instrument just one more time? Can I play the instrument once more before it is consigned to to silence or before you kept it in a closet? He asked. And permission was granted. And the great violinist player played the violin And the violin filled the room with such heart-moving music that the collector's emotions were deeply stirred. And this is what the collector said. I have no right to keep that for myself. He exclaimed, It is yours, Mr. Kleisler. Take it into the whole world and let people hear it. Many of us, we are keeping this great violin inside our closet. We possess something that is so powerful that could change the lives of people. Even your loved ones, your neighbor, your classmate, your close friend, your mom, your dad. You are keeping it for yourself because you are afraid. You are doubting about it. You have it in your own possession. The gospel The gospel that could give hope to humankind. The gospel of Jesus is so good. And we don't have any right to keep it for ourselves. Let people hear it. Play the music. And let the people around you hear the music of the gospel. That they will be be able to hear the good news of God. This gospel healed the sick. This gospel made great breakthrough to the brokenhearted. This gospel saved people. This gospel gave hope to people. This gospel saved my life, saved my whole family. 
I don't have any right to keep it for myself. Why evangelism? We have in our possession the greatest news. We have to share it. How can we keep it for ourselves, church? And not share something that can give music in the lives of people. How can we keep it to ourselves and not share something that can heal the brokenhearted? How can we keep it to ourselves and see people being lost? How can we keep it ours for ourselves and see people around us perishing, dying? Already five people died when I slapped my finger. Every second, I don't know how many people in, during the... Now, the statistic would say it's dying in every single second. I think one second, four or three people are dying. I don't know how many of them know, know Christ. How can we keep it for ourselves while seeing people living in bondage? John Collier was found guilty in the murder of 1949 and sentenced to life in prison. Later, he was paroled to work on a farm. He was paroled near Nashville, Tennessee. In 1968, from 1949 to 1968, John Collier's census was terminated. Awesome. And a, letter be, and a letter bearing the good news was sent to him. But John never saw the letter. John never heard that he was already free. Ten years went by. He didn't hear anything about his freedom. Then state parole officer learned about Courier's plight, found him, and told him that his sentence had been terminated after 10 years. He told, he was there, working so hard, not realizing that he already had a freedom. He was a free man. Christians have been entrusted with the most important message in the world. But there are many people suffering around us while we are hiding it. We forget to tell the gospel, the message to other people. We possess the greatest news in our hands. We have to share it. We have to say it and, sh- and let people hear the word of God. And third point is we can bring hope by sharing the good news. You can bring hope by sharing the good news. If only the man who who hold the letter for John Carrier could, if only he was able to divulge or bring the message, he could have experienced his freedom earlier. We could bring hope right now. To the person waiting at your workplace on Monday. You could bring hope to the person waiting for you at the bus station. Or maybe the the person behind the counter. We can bring hope to people who are looking for life's meaning in this world. But many people would like to believe that they could only find hope that they could only find salvation, that they could only be saved by material things. But this verse tells us that only believing the good news and is baptized will be saved. Many will receive hope. Don't think that being saved is just being dead. When you are saved, you have a life that is full of hope, your family that is full of hope, your work that is full of hope, but Many people need to bring to hear the, 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 the Word of God in order for them to receive the hope. Many people believe that money can give them hope. That's why they're having three jobs, four jobs. I've seen many people got so money, but they don't hope. They don't have any hope. They just died. And no hope. But they got a lot of money. So money is not the, the answer. Many people, they said that at least 15 jobs uh, on your lifetime, jobs, 
changes in your lifetime, 15 jobs, even though you change 100 jobs a year, you will not be satisfied unless you won't believe the gospel. The hope is in the gospel. The hope is in the word of God. It's not on relationship either. Though you change relationship from one another, and though you change, even though you have friends, 1,000 friends or 10,000 Facebook friends, 100 million uh, Twitter follower or Instagram follower, they are not your friends anyway. But you cannot find hope with friends. Yes, they could help. They can inspire you. They can make your day right. But at the end of the day, it's, the, it's believing in the good news that we are about to share them. Because there is power in the Word of God. The Word of God will set you free. It's not also in the, in the power. People would like to have power, power in the position, power in the government. That will not give you hope. That will not give you a lasting hope. That will not give you a lasting uh, happiness. How many people has the power in their hands still living miserably? Not even fame. Even though you're the most famous person at your school, or even you're the most famous person in the universe, still, if you don't have the Word of God, no one shared the gospel to you, and you don't believe, you will not be saved. You, will not, you, you don't have any hope. Not even religion. Don't say that you are a very religious person. But if you don't have Christ in you, Again, there's no hope. You will not be saved. I'm telling you, there are people in the it does, if you are people in the church does it mean that you are in Christ. Unless that person in the church heard the message and believe and respond, then that's the time you will have Christ. It doesn't mean just merely re- listening to the gospel that I've been preaching every Sunday after Sunday will save you. It's in believing and responding to the word of God. That you are a child of God. That you accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. So money, job, relationship, power, fame, and religion cannot save you. So do not waste your time pursuing all these things. These are just temporal things. Pursue Christ, and all these things shall be added unto you. That's what the Bible said. And lastly, people are lost without hearing the good news. They are lost. That's the reason why we need to share the gospel. Why evangelism? Because people are lost without hearing the good news. But whoever does not believe will be condemned. It says in Revelations 20, 15, anyone whose name was not found written in the book, those are the people who didn't believe the gospel, who didn't believe the good news. Anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life was thrown in the lake of fire. What that's fire? That's a lake of fire. That's hell. That's eternal life with punishment. Can you imagine yourself enjoying all these things, enjoying music, enjoying fellowship, life group, prayer, and there are people who is bound to the lake of fire. Who knows Salvation Army? Salvation Army. It was founded by Booth. Okay, William Booth. He saw a vision. A vision that brought revival during the early, the late 1800. And I would like to show the video of this vision. This is just a dramatization. This is not that actual, okay? This is just dramatization of his vision that he saw in his prayer time. And this brought revival during his time. And it brought impact to Pentecostalism, to all churches nowadays. So, William Booth, Salvation Army, if you're buying some uh, stuff from there, this is his vision 100 years ago. I have
had a vision. I saw a dark and stormy ocean. In that ocean, I thought I saw multitudes of poor human beings plunging and floating and shouting and shrieking, cursing and struggling and drowning. And out of this dark, angry ocean, I saw a mighty rock that rose up with its summit towering high above the stormy seas. And all round the base of the rock, I saw a vast platform. And on this platform, I saw with delight a number of the poor wretches continually climbing out of the angry ocean. And I saw that some of those who were already safe on the platform were fervently helping the poor creatures still in the angry waters to reach safety. But something puzzled me. Although they had all been rescued at one time or another from the ocean, nearly everyone seemed to have forgotten all about it. Anyway, the memory of its darkness and danger no longer troubled them. And what was equally strange and perplexing to me was that most of these people did not seem to have any care, that is, any agonizing care, about the poor perishing ones who were struggling and drowning right before their eyes. Those on the platform to whom he called were so taken up with their trades and professions and money saving and pleasures and families and community and gatherings and religions and arguments about it. And so the multitude went on struggling and shrieking and drowning in the darkness. And then I saw something that seemed stranger than anything that had happened before in this very strange vision. Those whom this wonderful being cried out to, to come and help him in his difficult task, were always praying and crying to him to come to them. Some wanted him to come and stay with them and spend his time and strength in making them happier. Others wanted him to come and take away various doubts and misgivings they had concerning the truth of some letters which he had written them. Others wanted him to come and make them feel more secure on the rock, so secure that they would be totally sure they would never slip off again. They used to meet and get as close to the rock as they could, and looking towards the mainland where they thought the great being was, they would cry out, Come to us, come and help us. But all this time, he was down among the poor drowning creatures, crying to them in a hoarse voice, Come to me, come and help me. My friends in Christ, you are rescued from the waters. You are on the rock. Jesus is in the dark sea, calling on you to come and help him. Will you go? I had a vision. I saw a dark and stormy ocean. I'm finishing here. Some of you are challenged by that video, right? Some of you were stirred by this video. But some of us are afraid to do it. Let's be honest. We're afraid to go. Some of us are doubting about it. Some of us are thinking that it will bring discomfort to our families, to our work. But some of us as well are busy, so much busy with our families, with our work, with our thing. That's why we cannot go. As I have said a while ago, church, you are the church. Church is part of your family. It is part of your life. You're just a lawyer. You're just a teacher. You're just bringing church to your company. You're just bringing church to your workplace. You're just bringing church to your school. Actually, church is your lifestyle. This is not just a thing that we do on our spare time. This is what we do for life. You are called to be a Christ follower. Church is your life. You are not just here to please people, to please the pastor because you are present. This is your life. But take heart. These signs will accompany those who believe. In my name, they will drive out demons. 
Yes, it's hard. It's fearful, scary to share the word of God. You might be de- you might be rejected. You might be uh, 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 laughed at or not at. But God said there is an assurance here that in my name these signs will accompany those who would believe, those who would go. In my name they will drive out demons. You could drive out demons. It's literally uh, fulfilled during the time of Acts. The apostles they drive they drove demons when they share the word of God. And not only that, they will speak in new tongues. Yes, the apostles speak in new tongues. It is a power for them to share the gospel. It was fulfilled during the time of Acts and even the time during, the, during these times. And they will pick up snakes with their hands. I'm not telling you that you would pick up snakes when you share the word of God. What, what I would like to tell you here Picking up snakes and drinking poison, meaning to say that sometimes it's dangerous. It's dangerous to share the word of God. But do not be afraid. But these things, it was fulfilled literally during the time of Paul. Paul was beaten by a snake, but he didn't die. But I didn't see anything, any fulfillment of drinking poison. What I would like to tell you here at church is, there's, yes, there's danger. It's scary sometimes, but do not be afraid. You can drive out demons during those tough times. Many people in the past history of churches, during the time of, of, of Luther, during the time of Calvin, during the time of D.L. Moody, during the time of William Carey, they all suffered for sharing the good news. But they, per, but they persevered because they were given the power of God. Not necessarily beaten by snake, not necessarily drunk poison, Yes, snakes are not necessarily crawling. They could also walk. But I'm telling you, God will help you. Poison doesn't necessarily mean you have to drink it. The world can poison your mind. The world could poison the mind of the people. But we have to take a stand. We have to stand strong. Be strong and be courageous in sharing and bringing the gospel to the poor, to the people who need God. It will not hurt them at all. They will place their hands on sick people and they will get well, meaning to say, when you obey God, miracles and wonders will just take place. Things that you can, do not expect, it might ha- it can happen. Who could stop God from doing that? He's powerful God. He is the creator of heaven and earth. If he would like, he, if he would like you to be beaten by a snake and you will be saved. He could do it. Who could question that? He is sovereign. All we need to do is just obey. But do not go out there, find a snake, and drink poison. No, I'm not telling you that. And you know what happened? After the Lord Jesus had spoken to them, and He was taken up into heaven, He, he sat at the right hand of God. After saying this to the apostles, to go and preach the gospel, Jesus Christ died on the cross. He resurrected back to life. He ascended to the heaven and He sat down at the right hand of God. Do you know what He's doing there? He's interceding for you. My son, my daughter, father, have you seen Joe? He's sharing the good news to this one. Can you help him? Can you empower him? My, my father in heaven, Jesus Christ said to the father, Ina is sharing the good news. He's afraid. He's, he's, he's not equipped. Can you help my daughter, Ina? to share the gospel to this person he is seated at the right hand of the father if you have a need Jesus knows your need and is interceding for you to the father he is seated at the father father can you see my son in G my dog he's suffering from this one can you help him come on it doesn't mean that you are not yet saved you are already saved it's just that we have to go through all these things in this world with pressures, with trials, but this good, it is so good that we have Jesus Christ, our intercessor, to the Father to help us. And you know what it says there? And law and, and the Lord worked with them. While God while Jesus was interceding to the Father for the people for, for me. Lord, work with them through the Holy Spirit who is with us, our helper, our God, our leader, and confirm His word by the signs that accompanied Him. Brothers and sisters, what you're going to do to the person next to you could be the confirmation of the word of God. 
for that person. My neighbor, my God promised him, I don't know my neighbor. I know he's an Indian. Promised him that he would be saved. And if I'm going to share the gospel to him, it is the confirmation of the promise of God, the word of God for him. Your obedience, sharing the word of God to the person next to you, to the person in your workplace at your school, is the confirmation of God's work to that family, to the person, to the to this to the relationship. Just knowing, obeying the word of God and believing, sharing the gospel and preaching everywhere, the Lord will work with you and confirm his word by the signs that accompanied it. God will confirm His word, His promise by fulfilling it through you. God can use other people if you would like to say no. Isn't that good? That God will use you to confirm His promise, His word to the person next to you. I am glad to be used by God in order for Him to confirm, to confirm His promise and His word to the person perishing around me. Lord, give me the power. Lord, give me the boldness to do that. Why evangelists in church? Because Christ died for people. He died for people. He died for you. Why evangelism? Because He was serious in saving you. He even died for you. Why evangelism? Because it is the answer. For people to be saved. Many people died in the past so that we can hear the gospel. We are saved from the penalty of sin. But we are not just saved from something, but we are saved for something. You are saved from the death, from punishment. Yes. But the good news says you are saved for something. You are saved for you to share the gospel. It won't just stop from you. You have to play the violin. You have to make music. You have to let people hear the music of the gospel in your life. That they may be able to enjoy the music. That they will be able to be set free. That they will be healed by the power of the gospel. That is to bring the people to, people to Christ. That is why we need evangelism. We need evangelism.